Let's get started with the Snowflake API in Postman. We'll start off by investigating some of Snowflake's SQL API endpoints, and then we'll talk about an API workflow that helps us deal with long running queries. Let's get started. In Postman, I'm logged in here. The first thing I'll do is I'll search in Postman for Snowflake. And I see there are some resources, including this official looking public workspace by Snowflake themselves. Let's check it out. Inside their workspace, we see a V2, V1 and V2. V1 appears to be deprecated. We can browse some of their documentation if we want and take a look at their endpoints. Or this looks pretty good. We can fork it to our own workspace. So here I'm creating a fork. Snowflake owns the Snowflake public workspace and this collection, but I can fork it to my own collection in order to send API calls or make any adjustments that I want. I'll label my fork and then move it over to a workspace I have that's called Snowflake Build. I'm not gonna fork it now because I've already done that, but if I haven't, then I would go ahead and hit this button right here. Let's go back to the search results. There is something interesting. I was actually playing around with this earlier here under Postman DevRel, I have a separate workspace with some other resources. So let's go to that second search result there and see what's in that workspace. So earlier I told you, I didn't lie, here's the collection from the Snowflake public workspace that I forked over. And I also have a collection called Get Started with Snowflake in Postman. If I click on that collection, on the right side, I can see some documentation about what is this collection and what's in there. There's two folders, there's a quick start, and then that API workflow that I was telling you about earlier for dealing with a long running query. Let's scroll down to the get started. It looks like I'll need a base URL. This is gonna be available in your Snowflake console. And then I'll need a token to authorize and authenticate my API calls. Here's a link to more documentation about how to generate key pair authentication tokens, but let's go over to my terminal. I'm in a directory called Snowflake, and if I list out what I have here, I've already generated my public and private keys. You can see them in those local files. So what I'm going to do is I already have Snowflake SQL installed on my machine, but I'm going to be generating a new JSON web token using my private key and my cloud account, generating this token for user called Jalen. Let's hit enter and execute that SnowSQL command. I have encrypted my passphrase and lo and behold, here is my access token. I'm gonna copy this to my clipboard and return to Postman. I've already generated my access token using SnowSQL and now I'll be needing it here. So I can continue reading the documentation to see what I'm gonna be doing. But under the collection, I'm gonna tab over to variables. And I've already popped in my base URL here that I found on my Snowflake dashboard console. And then I'm going to be pasting this here under current value. I'm gonna paste it there and tell you why I put it under current value instead of initial value. Current value is available for just me. I'm in a public workspace. You might be in a team workspace. You might not be working on your own. So if you are wanting to share the credential, you will want that token to display under initial value. But because I want to keep that private, I don't want to share my access token, I'm going to leave it under current value. Now, if I had generated an access token for a test user instead of user JLyn, say I wanted to generate a certain profile of a user and then share it with my entire team, I would want that token available in the initial value with this being in a team workspace. Let's go ahead and hit save. It's very important that you understand the difference between initial value and current value and how you can control that data. So now that I have that loaded in, let's go under the authorization tab. So with this collection, we have one authorization type set out to cascade and inherit to every request within this collection. You can see that the type is bearer token and there's this double curly brace token here. And if I hover over it, you can see that Postman is now substituting in that current value 
you can see the scope is at the collection level. That's what I just pasted under the variables tab. Now we can use this token throughout every request within this collection. Okay, so I think we have what we need. Let's go ahead and open the quick start folder and load up that first post call we have called SQL query by rows. If we hover over the double curly brace variables, you can see what Postman is resolving each variable as. This is my cloud account with the variable at the collection level. And here is a variable for UUID. If I generate or use a UUID to execute a SQL statement, then I should be able to use that same unique identifier to retrieve my results. This prevents me executing accidentally a bunch of times many duplicate queries and wasting a bunch of compute power. So what I'm going to be doing is generating a random UID, and you can see how I'm doing that here under pre-request script. Pre-request scripts are JavaScript that executes before your main call, before your main call outlined here. I'm going to be using Postman and JavaScript to generate a random unique identifier. And then we're going to set it as a collection variable to then again reuse later on when we want to retrieve our results. All right, now let's look at the body. What are we articulating in the request body? You can see that I'm querying a database called Snowflake Sample Data in Warehouse S. You'll want to plug in your own information here for your own database in Warehouse. And we have a statement here. You can edit this if you're familiar with SQL, or you could just hit send and see what happens. You can note that the row count that I intend to retrieve is 600, but you can, again, increase that to more if you want. So let's hit send. Postman is firing off that statement, and Snowflake servers are replying with this response here. It's a 200 OK. That means it was successful. And if I go here and slide this over a little bit, I have a lot of information. Let's collapse some of these. Here's partition or page information, row types. Here's the actual data. And at the very bottom, I see some additional metadata about our query. We'll want to snag this statement handle so that we can retrieve the results of our query later on. And you can also see the request ID that was randomly generated. However, we know how to create variables. We know how to get and set variables in Postman now. So if I look under the Tests tab, this is where JavaScript will execute after our main request. You can see that I've already wrapped in a Postman test the setting of a variable called statement handle. So all I'm doing there on row eight is parsing that JSON response to capture the information statement handle and save it as a variable called statement handle. And in fact, if we go back over to our variables, we should be able to see the UUID saved as a current value as well as statement handle saved as a current value so that we can use them in subsequent requests. OK, so let's clean up some of these tabs and move on to the next call. This one is going to check the status of the execution. And if we hover over the UUID, you can see it's still using that same unique identifier that we executed our initial post call at and hit send. Snowflake servers are telling us, yep, it finished. And here's the information that you previously retrieved. Let's move on to the next folder in our Get Started collection. Let's collapse Quick Start and expand Polling. Let's load up SQL Query by Time. Once again, we see a very similar setup. We have our base URL. We have our UUID. We'll generate a new one this time just so that we have a different unique identifier to retrieve our results on. And under the Body tab, you can see a slightly different query. This one has a time limit of 20. You can increase it to longer if you want. But this is an example, assuming I can click fast enough, of a long running query. It'll take about 20 seconds. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Send. And this time, you can see 202 accepted. It's an asynchronous execution in progress. And let's go check the status of this call. 
Tool two accepted. Still working. Asynchronous execution in progress. Send again. Yup, still working. And in fact, this query should be working for about 20 seconds total. Let's see how long it takes. Okay, there we go. So I pressed send a couple times to keep checking. And finally, instead of 202, we get back 200 OK. And once again, we have the information that we were playing around with earlier. Here is the statement executed successfully metadata. So for long running queries like that, you're always welcome to step through and periodically send a get. But what if you want to automate that process so that you don't have to manually check the status every time? So under the get request, let's look under the tests tab. Again, this is going to be JavaScript that executes after the main call. If I look at rows 7 to 17, you can see an if else block where we're checking for the asynchronous query. If it's still running, we should get back a 202 HTTP status code. And if it's completed, we should get back a 200 HTTP status code. So we're going to be checking and then pausing for three seconds with this set timeout before checking again. And this is how we control the workflow. We're actually going to be setting the next call to run as checks the status, which is this current call that we're on now. So it's going to be calling itself. And if it gets back a 202, it's going to call itself again. 202, call itself again. Oops, 200. Kick out to the next row of code, which is proceed to the next request called notification. OK, so we can step through and see what that looks like again. Or we could do something special and run it all in one go. So for under this folder called polling, I'm going to run the folder. You can see the three calls that might be running at any given time when we hit send. And we're going to be running manually this folder in the collection runner. So let's get started. Postman's kicking off that first SQL call, checking get status. It's 202. So three seconds later, it's setting it again. 202, three seconds later, if I knew how to divide 20 seconds by three seconds, I would know how many times Postman will check the status before I receive a notification. So it's still 202, and it'll keep calling itself. It might be an infinite loop if it never reaches 200, but it did. And so once, once Postman receives the 200 status code, it kicks over to that last post call to send me a notification or send myself a text message or whatever it might be. So for long running queries, this is one way where you can automate the process of checking the status. So we looked at a few different ways to handle long running queries. We stepped through one API call at a time. We did a little bit of automation by just running the entire folder in one go and letting it iterate on itself until it kicked out to a 200. And the last way, there's a few different ways you can run it. You can schedule it on Postman Cloud. You can run it from your CLI. But a lot of times, you already have your integration or application that you're working on. So let's go back to our SQL query example. And maybe I'm fiddling with the parameters. Maybe instead of async true, I say async false. Or maybe I have more partitions. Or maybe I change my SQL query. Once I have everything working just the way I want it to, I can go over to the right-hand side, this code icon, and expand it. And here's where Postman will just replicate this client-side call, this API call, in a bunch of different languages. So if you're writing your service or integration in Go, you can see and copy to your clipboard, this is this exact API call replicated in Go, or whatever language you want to work with. So that's the Snowflake API. Let us know how you're working with it. Thank you.